quite a few results to share. Um, it's called RPPLNS or a pay per last 10 shares with a randomized twist. And this is joint work with Francisco Marmolejo Cosillo, Jonathan Katz, and Shin Yu Zhu. Uh, OK, so the talk basically is going to be about incentives and some other properties of mining pools, uh, well, incentives of the miners uh, belonging to them. And at first, I'm going to do a short introduction to what mining pools are and why they're necessary and what are their properties and how they're designed. And then I'm going to go into the RPPLNS protocol, which is a, a variant that we, we came up with of, uh, of PPLNS, which is uh, probably the most popular mining pool protocol right now. And then we'll have some some theoretical results, uh, proofs sometimes, to show the properties. And for some of them that we haven't come up with a proof yet, uh, I'll show some experiments that, uh, that seem to suggest the whole thing should work. OK, so what are my mining pools and why do we need them? Um, well, the first reason is that mining is very profitable. Well, can be profitable, um, but there is a very large variance in the payoffs. So for example, uh, the current block reward, so the amount of Bitcoins in dollars or value, uh, when somebody mines a new block, is 115,000. Uh, at least that was yesterday. Uh, and a block is found roughly every 10 minutes. And this is every 10 minutes for the whole Bitcoin network with all of its processing power. So especially, so if there is a smaller miner who might not have a supercomputer uh, yet, and they're just using like a, a regular computer or something like that to mine in, in during its downtime, they'd rather get a steady income most likely than have a tiny chance of getting so much money uh, sometime in the future. So, or as they say, we, as we say, they are risk averse. So to do this, to, to fix this variance issue, um, people have been combining their computational power together so that it's more likely that they mine a block uh, and then they share the rewards. Okay, so, um, Basically, it's what I said before, it's uh, they combine their powers and form pools. And let's see, these pools need to have a couple properties uh, before going into the details of specific pool implementations. So um, these usually are compared to mining alone, except for one, and I'll talk about this. So the first thing that we want out of a mining pool is fairness. So if somebody has a specific hash rate, which he would yield uh, some kind of expected uh, uh, reward over a period of time, joining a pool should not change it. It shouldn't decrease it. I mean, if it increases it, it's, I guess it's better, but this is not possible. So uh, it shouldn't decrease it. It should be the same. Um, the second is a variance reduction, which is, People are getting an expectation, the same payoff as if they were mining solo, but the var variance is smaller. So they're not going to get a huge chunk of money far in the future. They're going to get a bit of it every few days. Um, OK, the other one, and here we're getting into the more pool-specific properties, is what we call robustness against pool hopping. Um, so imagine in a situation where there are multiple mining pools. Being in a specific mining pool should be um, better than jumping around into different pools. So a pool should have a property of being a team that people want to stay inside. They want to leave. They don't want to leave for another one. Uh, and the last one is incentive compatibility, which is generally the hardest to prove, which is members of a pool are not just there to collect some money once in a while, but they're really, really active players. They, they spend, they maximize the reward by spending all the effort they can and playing by the pool's rules, which we're going to see what these are. So uh, before going into the theorem stuff, 
let's see the, the structure and some notation that we're going to use for pools. So the pool has a pool operator, which might be a smart contract, might be an actual person. Uh, usually his job is pretty simple. So the first, uh, the pool operator will guide the pool to mine. So they'll say, okay, we want to mine uh, that block. And this usually will be the honest block. Um, okay. After that, until somebody has added a block uh, to that and extended the, the like tip of the blockchain, um, the miners, they, there needs to be a way to keep track of how much work they've done. So every time a miner finds a block that is um, good enough, but not good enough to, you know, he finds, he finds a block that's, it's not exactly a block because it can't be added, but it's hash is good enough to beat a lower difficulty, not the big difficulty of the Bitcoin network, but the bit difficulty of the pool. Then we call this a share. So a share is like a mini block. It's something that the pool recognizes as effort, but the network that the whole blockchain network doesn't. Uh, and the miners will report these, uh, these shares, as we say. Then when a block is found, the operator will pay some amount to each pool member which this will be a function of the shares that have been reported. Okay, and to put it in some notation, we suppose, first of all, that the difficulty parameter is D. Specifically, in this talk, the way we're going to use this D number is the higher the D number, the easier it will be to mine compared to Bitcoin. So if D is a thousand, this means that it's a thousand times more likely to get a share than to get a block. Um, then we're assuming that there are n pool miners, m1 up to mn, and one of them is not honest. And we're going to study him separately to show that his best response is to be honest as well. Then we say that a pool miner mi has hash power uh, alpha i, uh, which means this is his hash power for mining shares. So specifically, at every step, uh, this is a discrete time process, uh, except for one result. Um, we're assuming that alpha i is a probability that mi mines a share. And here's where the difficulty comes into play. Um, we also say that there's a further one over d probability on top of that, of that share being a full block. Um, oh, just to add a, a tiny point here, this D parameter in most pools, although this is not really standardized and there isn't too much research that I know of in optimizing the D value, it's usually selected to be of the order of N, of the number of miners in the pool. It might be, I think, the only value I've seen written down in uh, any kind of publication is N over 2 as a suggestion. Uh, but most pools don't actually reveal, at least they don't make it easy to find what it is. Um, okay. Then the pool has an internal state, which keeps track of the shares somehow. And this will evolve depending on what shares are being reported and what blocks. And using that, the payments will be, will be allocated. Okay. Before going to PPLNS, we're going to see some very simple mining pools that are worth mentioning just to see the shortcomings and how these were alleviated. So the simplest, perhaps the simplest idea to, to do a mining pool is to just collect all the shares. And at the end, once a block is found, we can just pay each user uh, a fixed amount, uh, which is multiplied by the proportion of shares they have. So let's call that one block has a block reward of one. Every user would be awarded the proportions of, of shares he has at that point times one. So this is fair because uh, the higher the hash power, the higher the proportion of shares you will have. It's budget balanced, so the pool operator will never have to pay more than the block reward. And it reduces variance. However, it's not incentive compatible and it's not hot proof. And the reason it's neither of those things is that the proportion of shares increases faster the less shares somebody has in the pool. So if somebody has no shares and finds one, that's a pretty big increase. However, he has a, a thousand shares and finds one more, 
there's almost no difference in, in the reward he's going to get. Um, so he might be incentivized to mine a bit and then have small amounts in different pools. And for the same reason, it's not incentive compatible. Um, so how about if we don't do this and we just pay a fixed amount per share? We don't care about the proportion. Let's just pay it like that. So this is fair, it reduces variance, and it's incentive compatible. Because as long as this fixed amount uh, is, is good enough, um, there's no reason to stop mining shares. The more somebody mines, the more he's going to get paid. However, it is not hot proof. And uh, most importantly, it's not budget balance for the pool operator. So unfortunately, that doesn't quite work either. But there is a way to fix this. And this is the currently most common mining protocol. It's called the paper last end shares. And instead of keeping track of all the shares that have been mined for between two blocks, uh, the pool only cares about the last N shares. And this, maybe I should have used a different symbol, but this capital N is not the same as the, as the number of miners. It's, it's different. Um, so uh, the shares here, they're in a queue. And specifically what happens, we have the shares from, uh, from oldest to newest, from left to right. And whenever a new share, and suppose that the queue is full now, we have n shares. When a new share appears, it's going to be added to the queue, and it's going to knock the oldest share out. And after the oldest share is pushed out, it's gone. Uh, so let's see. So updating the protocol like that is fair, uh, hot proof, and reduces variance. Um, because it has all the properties of the previous protocols, but it has a parameter that keeps the user engaged somehow. If a user hops to a different pool and, and waits, then his share is gonna is gonna be too old and it's gonna be pushed out and it's gonna get paid. Um, the only trick is the incentive compatibility, which there are proofs that it is uh, incentive compatible, but they only work for a very restricted set of strategies. Uh, specifically, the one that I'm familiar with works if the strategy is to hoard the shares and release them all at once with a block or mine honestly. If these are the only two strategies, mining honestly is always better than hoarding everything and then throwing it away and then publishing it with a, when a block is found. Uh, but maybe more nuanced strategies might be better. So here is where paper last n shares randomized comes in. So this is a, rand a, natural, a, random, a natural randomization of PPLNS where instead of having a queue, we had the idea of having a bag instead of that. And the bag is essentially, it's like a queue, but doesn't remember the order. It just has a fixed amount of things it can hold. So every time somebody reports a share to the operator, um, it uh, replaces a random share rather than the oldest. So something like that. And this, it seems, at first it seems, well, this is just the previous, but randomized. What's the, why is it better? And there are some reasons it might be better. Uh, so it has, it's fair, hot proof, and reduces variance, uh, same as before. But we can, at least for now, we can experimentally show that it is incentive compatible in a pure Nash equilibria sense. If everybody's mining honestly, then the best response of the remaining miner is to mine honestly. And, but, and there might be a pathway towards a proof, but it's not, it's not there yet. But there is a, a plan of attack. OK, so hopefully the, the protocol made sense. Uh, and now we're going to go into quickly sketching some proofs um, when it's possible, or just talking about the results for the, the, the basic things we prove. And this is quite similar for the other mining pool structures as well. OK, the first thing, the easiest, I would say, to show is that randomized paper last and shares is fair. 
Um, so rigorously, uh, suppose that we have an honest miner M with a hash power of alpha, then the expected per turn block reward is alpha over D, where D is a difficulty. So uh, bear in mind that the reason it's fair is that if he was mining on his own without the pool, he would have a alpha over D chance of uh, finding a block at every step. Alpha is his hash power within the pool, as deemed in T is a difficulty parameter that says how much harder it is to mine an actual block. So here, uh, clearly, uh, whether he's inside the pool or outside, his expected reward is the same. There is a minor caveat that usually a pool operator will skim uh, some amount, and he won't actually pay exactly alpha over D of the block reward. But this is typically very, very small. So generally in papers, people ignore it. OK, so the proof sketch, which this is a, it's pretty, pretty simple. So after M mines a share, uh, let Z, Z be a random variable of the share's lifespan. So it's, it goes in the bag, and then it will live for a few steps. But it, there is a chance that every step that's going to be pushed away. Uh, Z minus one, however, follows a geometric distribution with mean N minus one, because the first turn that it's inside, it's going to stay inside because it's just been mined. And then after that, there is a one over N chance of kicking it out at every step. So this gives us a geometric distribution. Then if we say that uh, YI indicates if somebody, somebody mined the block, I turns after the share, we have that the expected payoff, uh, like the payoff as a random variable, is this x, which is the sum for all the rounds that the share is alive, times uh, yi over n. And all of these variables here are independent. So instead of doing it like that, we can uh, use Wall's equation and pull out the sum outside, essentially. Because the sum, the its borders are randomized, so we can just have it like this. Uh, all the yi's have the same expectation, and the expectation of z is n because z plus one is geometric with mean n minus one, and the expectation of uh, of y is one over d, and then we have the one over n. So multiplying everything together, we get uh, one over d. So 1 over d is the expected payoff of a single share. Uh, and then since the chance to mine a share at every step is alpha, putting both together, we know that the expected payoff per turn is alpha over d. OK, let's move on to the second result. The second is the variance reduction, which is a slightly more fine-grained analysis of what goes on inside the pool. And we're not going to go into too much detail here. But basically, the variance looks like that. This is very similar to the PPLNS variance. It's about twice as big as the PPLNS variance because of the added randomness. Um, and as a comparison, somebody who would be mining on his own, he would have a variance of alpha over d minus alpha square over d square which is uh, much larger because the alpha square over d squared term is shared between the two variances. And then the first has a term alpha over nd plus alpha over d squared, whereas the second has only an alpha over d. However, d is much, much larger than alpha. Alpha will be a very small real number representing the hash power, uh, which can be at most one whereas t and n will be roughly the, si the size of the of n. Uh, uh, sorry, a d will be roughly the size of n, and n for a big pool might be billions, trillions, more. It might be huge. So the variance is actually is insignificant, whether it's randomized PPLNS or just PPLNS. OK, then we have the hop proof. And this, this needs a, a slight assumption, which is very standard 
uh, in the hop proof uh, world. So, um, okay, it's not really the assumption. So, uh, rather than assuming a discrete time step situation, we're going to assume a Poisson process uh, situation here that blocks come from. And this will be clear uh, in a second. So, in a post, we, we're assuming that blocks are mined by a Poisson point process of rate one. And the rates for the two um, two different pools that we're examining, whether it's good to hop from one to the other, have rates D1 times H1 and D2 times H2, where HI is the pool's uh, hash power. So why do we do this? Well, the reason we do it, you, you have to use some sort of relaxed version instead of a per turn uh, approach, is that if somebody, even in PPLNS, if somebody has mined so much that all of the shares are his, then next turn, if he mines another one, he's just going to add it and get rid of one of his own. It's better to just add it to a new PPLNS pool where the share is going to live longer. Uh, this is a bit of an artifact, though. And the way to get around it is to assume a Poisson point process uh, of a duration t that will exclude such sort of corner cases, like what would happen if you knew you would mine the next share and you had uh, n shares available. So if we assume this slightly smoothened situation, we can show this. Now, uh, this is not much point in reading it, but basically, if somebody splits his time into intervals I1 up to IK of mining between M1 and M2, the two pools, we can show that his reward is alpha over D1, where alpha 1 is his uh, initial endowment of shares in pool 1, plus alpha over 2, which is his initial endowment in the second pool over D2, plus alpha times T. Crucially, the reason this, in a sort of roundabout way, shows that it is um, hope proof is that the final expression of the reward does not depend on the partition of how he mine, how the user, the miner, hopped from one pool to the other. So this means that he, if it doesn't matter how he hops around, he just doesn't have to do it. Um, okay, the the theorem is not that important. The important for the in the world of pool mining is the assumption of the Poisson point process when the step uh, stepwise uh, approach is a bit too, too clunky. Okay, and now this is the last uh, result. Uh, and technically the, the main interest, because at the end of the day, uh, RPPLNS, uh, its claim over PPLNS is that there is a slightly better motivation in terms of uh, incentive compatibility. Is that RPPLNS incentive compatible? Uh, so, it's incentive compatible with a minor caveat that also holds for PPLNS, that this only happens if the miners are not too far away of the steady state. So if the pool has hash power beta, the remaining, and the miner has a hash power of alpha, the steady state would be to control alpha over alpha plus B beta times N shares. This would be the steady state, given that the uh, the properties we've shown so far. If we're close to that, then the pool, the miners will be incentivized to keep mining and reporting the shares and block immediately. Now, to show this or to set up the experiment that supports this, um, what we can do is we we have a situation with one honest miner, oh, sorry, one uh, deviating miner, M1, uh, all the other pool miners, we assume they're going to be honest and call them M2. It doesn't matter that we've bundled them up together because if they're honest, they're going to do the same thing. No matter who of them mines, it's going to do exactly the same thing. So we can bunch them up together. And then we have the honest extra pool miners that are uh, outside of the, of the pool and might affect it. So. This suggests that 
we as looking from the world from the perspective of M1, we have a formulation where the system can be captured by a tuple LSB, where L is the shares of M1 in the bag, S is the private shares which he has collected but hasn't revealed yet, and B is whether M1 has a private block that he hasn't revealed, because B because the honest the miner might want to keep everything, and once he finds a block, reveal it then, or do something like that. Now, doing this, we can compute a recursive equation that gives us, after k turns, the uh, optimal expected payoff, uh, the expected optimal payoff, rather, um, of the strategic agent after k turns. This has, he has four things he can do. He can either wait uh, and mine. He can uh, wait if he has maxed out of shares. He can publish a share or he can publish a block. Now, every term of this is very long and we won't have time to go into it, but basically taking a million cases, we can fill this equation. Let's skip this. Um, okay. What this tells us, however, is that we can devise a potential by taking the limit of this as k goes to infinity, or very large with a computer, and dividing by k. So this f of LSP is how much better one state is than another. And specifically, if we can show that the potential of state L plus one is bigger than the state L comma one, this would mean that having L plus one public shares is better than having L public shares and one private. Therefore, you're incentivized to release shares immediately. And the second one says that if you have a private block, FL01, the right-hand side, it's worse or equal to keep it for yourself rather than to reveal it and jump to these other states. The first one is if you actually add that block to the bag as well. The second is if you add it, but inadvertently kick out one of your own shares. Yeah, now, up. yeah. Let me, there's one plot I want to show. It's, uh, it'll be quite, quite quick. So by, fi by finding whether these conditions hold, we can compare different fractions like uh, of uh, hash rates from 0 0.05 up to a very large number, up to one almost, and show that which is the area of honest mining. And this shows, it shows lots of things that we won't go into now, but it shows that if the hash power of miner M1 on the bottom is contained is smaller than the fraction, is similar to the fraction of shares he owns, then he mines honestly. If his hash power is much more than what he has, he hoards blocks. And if he's too powerful and he has too many shares, he might start hoarding shares at the other end. But if he's not too uh, low in terms of blocks or too high in terms of shares or his steady state, it's going to be honest and publish everything immediately. OK, and the further work, it's pretty obvious. Just do this theoretically and show a few more advantages, like an informational thing. OK, uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry that I went a bit over. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, we will defer the question and answer to the question and the answer session so we can let uh, David uh, start on time. Yeah.